Good afternoon. I'm Diane Toscano, spelled T-O-S-C-A-N-O. -O. I'm the founder of Toscano Law Group, and I'm here today with co-counsel Kevin Biniazin, spelled B-I-N-I-A-Z-I-N. I'm sorry, Z-A-N. That's okay. Biniazin. And we represent Abby Sorner. Uh, I want to give a few brief remarks, then Kevin will give a few brief remarks, and we'll take a few questions at the end. So in the last 48 hours, a special grand jury impaneled with citizens from the city of Newport News uh, spoke loudly and clearly. They said, it ain't over yet. They said, we have not forgotten. They said, no, Newport News school leadership, you will not escape accountability for this tragedy. They reminded us that justice will prevail in this case. I just want to applaud the work of the special grand jury, the citizens that served on that panel, and the work of the Newport News Commonwealth attorney, Howard Gwynn, and his associates, who steadfastly committed to getting justice for Abby and for those involved. It's commendable that they met and they did this investigation over the last year. It's clear that what the school board takes for granted, the citizens of Newport News will defend, and that is the health and the safety of the Newport News students and the teachers that are dedicated to those students. It was almost 15 months ago that I stood at the same lectern in the same conference room to announce the bombshell revelations that Rich Neck administration ignored multiple warnings that could have prevented the shooting of Abby Zorner. And while we learned this week that a special grand jury investigated these very details, over many months, it confirmed my initial account in what they called, quote, a tragic and avoidable event. What I said then was, the administration had the opportunity to remove the imminent threat from the classroom, but didn't do so. That Abby wasn't shot in front of those horrified kids, all because the school administration failed to act. I said that the administration never called the school resource officer which they were obligated by policy to do so. That had school administration not been so paralyzed by apathy that they could have prevented this tragedy. Now we've all heard the expression, see something, say something. Well, the lesson in the case here is when you see something, say something, you do something. When teachers and students say something and see something, school leaders must do something. And the administration of Richneck Elementary School failed to act. Now, the special grand jury report was thorough and detailed and included sworn testimony that we were not privy to. And after reading that special grand jury report, I learned a few things. Perhaps the most troubling is what the report says about missing disciplinary records. The report lays out a concerning trail of evidence that apparently shows efforts by the school division to downplay disciplinary records prior to the shooting even taking place, and then hide them afterwards. If the citizen panel believes that this may have been a cover-up, which is their words, I have no reason to doubt them. In addition to the question of possible obstruction of justice, Serious questions need to be answered by the school board and the culture, about the culture that they oversaw of being loose with disciplinary records and that put our teachers and our students in danger. The public needs to know, why does it seem that Rich Neck administration wanted to short circuit the school system's discipline record system? Who encouraged them to do that? Was the school system trying to downplay or hide behavior problems across the district, and for what purpose? What was, the st what was at stake for them if they reported these discipline numbers, were either up or down? And thanks to the work of the Citizen Panel and the Newport News Commonwealth's attorney, they have exposed some troubling information. And I applaud and encourage their continued investigation. In addition, we encourage both the Virginia and U.S. Department of Education to do their own investigation. Uh, and look into some of these new disturbing uh, uh, 
items that have been found in the special grand jury report. Um, and Kevin will now answer any, Kevin will now have some statements. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. There's been a lot of attention on this grand jury report and for good reason. But I think what we need to focus on here and what I hope people will focus on is the effect that this is going to have on everybody's lives that were in that school that day. Uh, Abby Zwerner and her actions that day that ultimately led to her collapsing outside the closed doors of the principal and assistant principal at Rich Neck Elementary, uh, those moments in time will drag out for the rest of her life and feel like an eternity. And as much as our criminal justice system continues to pursue the just and righteous outcome for the conduct of those people who were there at the school, who are responsible for the conduct at the school board, ultimately our involvement here is to ensure that she achieves justice in her own right. And when there is a conversation about what should have been done, someday we're going to have to reckon with the fact that someday this will go out of the, the news camera's sight and Abigail Warner is going to have to continue to live the rest of her life with these disturbing memories buried into her mind. And how do we as a public, how do we uh, as the press, focus the attention on those who are most intimately and immediately affected by the actions on that day. The school board has a duty, an obligation to protect children, to protect teachers, to protect the rights of the parents who are trusting and entrusting each of their lives into the lives of these administrators and the school board themselves. And that duty, that obligation, requires forethought, and it requires, as Diane pointed out, that they follow what they promised they would follow to these students in their code of conduct, which is that they would speak up for safety, and that when something is saw, seen and heard, that they would do something. It was their protocols that required that an assistant principal and a school resource officer be the individuals who search the person if there is a threat. It's their protocols, it's their rules that required and placed the authority within the, the administration to take the appropriate conduct to ensure the safety of the students and teachers at this school and other schools. And what the special grand jury report reveals is that they didn't follow their own rules. We've said since the beginning of this legal proceeding, our legal proceeding, that the gun matters. And the gun does matter. Because when somebody comes into your office and says that there's a gun on campus, looking away from a computer screen should be a given. Taking immediate action, whatever it may be, should be a given. And it is a danger that is not commonplace, it is not ordinary or expected. It's a danger that required immediate response from the administration and the special grand jury report reveals that that did not take place. So we're here, we're proud to be here, we're proud to represent Abby as you all know, and we're proud to continue this fight on her behalf and hopefully seek additional answers and that fight may be more difficult because of the cover-up that's been unveiled by the special grand jury and the access to files that we may never know what they were, what they said, or what was there. But we'll keep fighting and we'll seek those answers and hopefully we'll be able to share more with you as time goes on. So I'd like to invite Diane back up so we can answer some questions. Okay. Yes. Michelle Anderson, WHRO. Um, in relation to the missing documents, when you and Abby were getting her lawsuit together, did she have any indication, any sort of sense that there were potentially systemic issues about missing documentation, um, just like bad 
record keeping at the school or at the district because I believe one of the documents that were missing was supposed to be in her classroom. Did she give any indication that she suspected issues like that before the shooting? I will tell you, Abby had been teaching, I believe that was her third year. She had been virtual for some time. She was back at school that year. Um, on the day that this event happened, she was taken from the school in an ambulance, so she didn't collect any of her belongings. Um, she left in an ambulance. So as we're going through the special grand jury report, uh, that's when it became real that there were lots of things missing. Did we suspect things had happened? Um, certainly, but this confirmed it. I think the special grand jury did an excellent job spending the last year investigating this and coming to the conclusions that they did. Did Abby return to her classroom at any point after the shooting? Uh, she returned once uh, at the end of the school year to help get her classroom ready as you do as a teacher and we were given a trespass letter. And in response to those files yes. as well, um, Commonwealth Attorney Howard Gwynn said you know, the statute of limitation on those is a year, so that could be another difficulty, another you know, bump in that road. What's your response to that? I'll let the Commonwealth Attorney figure out what crimes may have been committed, what the statute of limitations are. Um, and that's going to be for him to determine what he can and can't charge. Can you talk about how the criminal charges and possibly more criminal charges as well as any possible convictions could um, help or impact the civil lawsuit? Sure. Uh, well, I think at, at the outset you have to look at what question was being asked of the special grand jury. And when I pose that question, the reason is that they found that the conduct of uh, the assistant principal at least had probable cause of willful and wanton conduct. And our lawsuit alleges that she acted with gross negligence and recklessness. And those legal standards have some mirroring in the law. And so what it should do and what we hope it does is that it opens people's eyes, especially the school board's eyes, uh, to what maybe the people in this room, maybe the people at home, certainly the people in the grand jury see as a, an objective view of the conduct that day is what we're saying it is in our lawsuit. You talk about how this is, you know, alleged lack of security, lack of administration. Do you think this is a lack of humanity approach that we have? The, this is, a, I view it as a systemic issue. Listen, you, you close the door in a circumstance uh, of extremists and you wonder what's going on through people's heads, but it's easy for us to stand in front of a podium a year later and, and judge. Uh, what I think what is important to say is that in that moment in time, I think we all expect our administrators, I think we all expect the people that are in charge and have leadership of these institutions are going to be the ones that step out front and not step behind a closed door. Uh, so yes, Abby has the report uh, and has reviewed it. Um, I don't know if it's in its entirety. It's very difficult to read it because it does line up with what happened that day. It does take her back to that day and those events. Um, but she is encouraged by the Commonwealth Attorney's Office and the special grand jury for doing this and pursuing what they can through the criminal justice system. But at the same time, it is a frustration that we are continuing to have to fight the school board at every turn in our civil suit. So it's a range of emotions that she feels, um, and as is expected. After, after reading the report, uh, were you aware that the student allegedly tried to shoot multiple times? I did not. I was not aware that the gun had jammed. I understood that there were bullets remaining in the magazine, um, but that was hard to read, um, it, to, to know that he tried to shoot a second time. What about in the report where it describes the incident where Abby goes to the principal's office and the principal comes out, sees her, and then goes back and shuts the door. Was that something you guys knew, especially since she was passed out in the back? It, it, that was news to me. Okay. and uh, And as I stated a moment ago, it's not what we would expect. I don't think it's what the, the public expects to occur when there's a teacher that has obviously suffered a gunshot wound and requires care in that exact moment. 
the last thing you expect is that a door is going to be closed. And you guys talked about um, the, the protocol that was in place, the SROs and the administrators being able to search uh, backpacks, you know, students, et cetera. Um, there was a portion in that report that said there was no clear answer as to why teachers felt they could not step outside the protocol, so you may call police or search student that felt. Was there a fear of repercussions if they were to kind of step outside of that boundary, and that's why, you know, sort of, I guess they didn't take matters into their own hands? When, you, when I review the report, the way that I see it is that everybody did their job except for at the administration level. Everybody did their job. They, they, they reported it. They said what they were supposed to say. They told who they, were, who they were supposed to tell. And importantly, there was one person who was the aggregate of information. There was one person that stood above it all and knew and heard and, and should have seen everything coming but chose to, to continue to look at her monitor or to do uh, some other act other than, as Diane pointed out, doing something to actually uh, take action to prevent this from occurring. Can you put into context what the revelations of the grand jury report mean for the strength of your case? I think it, sh it tells us what the general public, a, a group of jurors, are viewing and, and seeing the facts of the circumstances of this case being. I think that uh, we hope that the school board and their lawyers will see this and do something, right, and, and respond appropriately and, and understand that this is a serious matter that has systemic issues and we hope that it, it moves our case forward, but we totally understand and expect uh, that we're going to have to continue our fight, and we will. Just to drill down on, on that a little more, yeah. I mean, it's often said that a criminal case strengthens a civil case. And just trying to understand that a bit more, is it because you have um, prosecutors or detectives testifying during a trial, or does it maybe encourage the school board to settle? I mean, I'm just trying to understand why does a criminal case strengthen a civil case so much? Well, ultimately, we're going to have to prove every fact in our own case, okay? And, and so we're not, going to have, we're not going to be able to rely upon the findings of a grand jury or a criminal jury to say whether we win or lose. We're going to have to prove every fact in our own case. But what a criminal case and a continued investigation does is that it provides resources to the truth. It provides resources to unearthing and, and revealing the, the facts and the circumstances that will lead to a just and righteous outcome in both settings, right? What if we didn't know about 21 days or 19 days of a document in a car or at a home? What if we didn't know that fact, right? Those are circumstances that a criminal case, because of the immediacy and, and the, the ability of the criminal justice system to jump on an incident and have the power of a court to subpoena records, to issue a search warrant. Those are the types of circumstances that provide answers. And those answers ultimately lead to a just and righteous outcome. And that's, that's in the way that those two things help each other. Has Newport News Schools tried to settle at all with Florida? Uh, no, there's not been any attempt to settle. Yes. Um, can you confirm whether Ms. Werner was interviewed as part of the grand jury investigation? Yes, Ms. Werner has been cooperating with uh, the criminal investigation, most definitely. We are cooperating in every way we can. Have you heard from the school board's lawyers in the last 24 hours? We have not, no. You, you mentioned um, calling on the U.S., I guess the, the, uh, the Department of education. education and the Virginia Department, the U.S. Department of Education and the Virginia Department of Education to look into, I guess, the document issue. Well, one of the things when I look at the special grand jury report, and again, I've only had it and looked at it as long as everyone else has had it, um, but to see the findings that disciplinary behavior was not actually being notated as it should have been prior to January 6th is alarming. And then the records are missing. But I know, you know, the schools have a duty usually to report certain things to get federal funding and state funding. So I will explore what can be done if there's other agencies that need to investigate this. Um, but again, I applaud the Newport News Commonwealth Attorney's Office for taking this on and doing what they're doing. But two, two more two Okay, more. yes. <laughs> it's not just the, the missing records, it's also the other security issues they have. It's there's, everything, right? There's, there's a lot there. Investigation of not just Correct, there's a lot there that 
I think could cause maybe some other agencies to be interested in investigating. And we'll explore that. Last question. Hearing none. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you.